please join me in welcoming Jason Lim. Thank you. Thank you so much. It struck me uh, hearing the prayer, actually. Well, it was actually the first time that there was a prayer before a lecture in a college setting, so that was uh, it's unique. But the prayer is one of the part of when he said, uh, make the right decisions. That kind of really struck me because that's really tough to do, you know, making the right decision. How do you make the decision? How do you know it's right? So this is basically a personal narrative about how I, how I decided to make this decision to go into federal service. To do that, just let me tell you briefly about myself. Uh, I work at TSA. Uh, he introduced me as a working at the Business Transformation and Culture Office, but uh, that kind of disappeared about two weeks ago. That's how <laughs> fluid the situation is, especially during the transition period in which everybody is kind of getting ready for the transition. So I work at Surely right now I belong to the office of the deputy administrator. Uh, so I work at the front office. I made a conscious choice to work at the front office because I wanted to see how the transition went for a Department of Homeland Security component because it's the first time it's undergoing a presidential transition. So how do you, does this huge agency of 50,000 people with 45,000 TSOs uh, TSO, Transportation Security Officers, the airport screeners, spread out throughout the nation. How do you effect a smooth transition through this process? So I just wanted to be there as a witness because I thought it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see what these really great experience administrators really do, you know, what their strategy and some transition strategy to really effect a smooth changeover. And it's been fascinating to watch and it'll be fascinating through this election cycle and through next year to see how this kind of changes over, regardless of who becomes the president, really. And, you know, just briefly say a few things about TSA. Uh, is, TSA is the largest component within DHS umbrella. Uh, it's a, I think it was created, it was, I think it's the only component that was created from the ground up. You know, it wasn't like other legacy agencies kind of combining and splitting off and redesigning. No, this was created as, you know, from the ground up in a largest federal public uh, mobilization effort since World War II. So, you know, you had to federalize of about 450 airports right after 9-11. There was a mandate. And this is the result, this agency. That's how it became. So we have over, you know, 50,000 people, as I said, over 45,000 in the field working as airport screeners. And I work as basically an assistant to the chief of staff to the front office. And, uh, you know, so special projects and uh, speech, some speech writing, and uh, just really assist in any high priority, uh, you know, strategic projects that I can do. But this is not really about uh, what I do at TSA or TSA itself. It's about how I made this decision to become, to go from a chief of staff to a private consulting company. All of a sudden, I'm, I'm a Fed. That's what, you know, fellow employee, which I never imagined I would do because uh, I don't know, you know, growing up as a Korean American in the United States, it's, uh, it brings its own set of stereotypes. They're internal, not you know, more, which is stronger than external stereotypes. I still remember about 20 years ago, I don't know if you know uh, Margaret Cho, the comedian, you know, Margaret Cho. She's actually the first Korean American celebrity of sorts, and she hit it big being a comedian. And I remember watching her in, you know, in one of those shows, TV shows, Comedy, comedy Channel wasn't on that, but you know, one of those TV shows, and she came on, and this was a her big break, you know, she came on, her first routine, the first line of her routine, I still remember it vividly, watching on TV. Uh, well, first of all, I was surprised that a Korean woman would be on TV as a stand-up comedian, so that was shocking. And she would come out, and she was this really very typical-looking Korean. I mean, you couldn't tell she was Korean right off. That was surprising, you know. And she would just saunter off the stage and let the audience soak her in, right? Then she would kind of smile. She goes, I'm Korean-American. Then, you know, let the audience soak that in some more. 
then her first uh, big line, you know, the joke was, uh, uh, that, but I don't own a store or anything. <laughs> and everybody would laugh because everybody knew that, you know, first generation Korean Americans own stores, whether it be dry cleaners, which my father does, dry cleaners, car washes, uh, produce, whatever it was. You know, we own stores. Our parents own stores. They're store owners. And to a large extent, that was true. But the thing is, being children of the store owners, you thought you only had four choices in life growing up, literally. One, in the order of kind of priority, be a doctor. You know, that's, that's, that's good. That's the best thing you can do, right? Second, maybe not as good, but pretty much the same, be a lawyer, right? Go to good school, be a lawyer, right? That's good, too. Third, not as prestigious, a little disappointing, but you can make up by earning a lot of money, go to good school, get an MBA, work in Wall Street, or these days go to Hong Kong, go to London, you know, work in Asian financial markets. And you can make up uh, the disappointment by earning more money than lawyers and doctors. Right? Then fourth, you run your father's store, and that's a failure. You know, it seems funny thinking back, but those four choices were real. That, that was the only, they were the only choices that I had. So I went to Duke, biomedical engineering, and you know, I can't add two numbers. I mean, I just, I just hated math, physics, engineering, computer science, oh my God, Fortran, it still gives me nightmares. <laughs> and, but that was what I was expected to do because I took biomedical engineering. That was my major because it was easier to go to med school than be a pre-med. So it was all strategic positioning of your major to go to med school to become the doctor and the number one goal in life. Then I quit. I just didn't want to be a doctor. I just realized that two years, so it's too late to change your major. It just it was a lot of hassle. Then you can become a lawyer by becoming an intellectual property lawyer. You know, that wasn't that bad. But that was, you know, then that was when I started kind of thinking, I guess, maybe there were other choices. So anyway, you know, making a long story short, I started working for a consulting company. I was a chief of staff to this Korean-American business, businessman who founded his own consulting, international consulting company. Uh, and I was the fastest rising executive in the history of the company. So I was his chief of staff, you know, for a long time, six years. And really, I was, uh, did a lot of incredible stuff, saw a lot of things. You know, I actually invited Al Gore to Seoul on his first international, you know, event after his election defeat, you know. And that was interesting, you know. So I met all these interesting people, all these things. And my parents, you know, doing their store thing in Yonkers in a blue collar neighborhood in New York. Then 9-11 hit. And I was in New York then. I was living in Upper East Side. I don't know if you guys know New York, but uh, I had an early morning meeting across the river to Jer Jersey. So I went to Jersey. And I was in a meeting, and you know, one of our staff comes in and go, you know, it was 9:23 or something. I still remember that. The World Trade Center is down. I'm like, I mean, what does that mean? I mean, you know, it doesn't really register, right? Then everybody goes to TV and watches, and one of the towers was still up at that time. Then you know, I mean, I'm sure you just, you know. So I couldn't go home that, that day because the, all the bridges were locked and there were no hotel rooms, so I just slept in that office. <clears throat> and I lost, uh, later on I found out I lost three high school classmates because I went to school in the Bronx uh, because they were working at uh, Cantor Fitzgerald. So it does, you know, it did affect me personally. But, but you know, you get busy with life, you got a lot of stuff to do, you know, it's, it's, uh, you have to go to West Coast and you have to go to Korea, you have to go to China, and so you have to do this and this guy wants you to do this and, you know, you kind of forget. It's, still, it's there, it's shocking, it does affect you, but you do forget, right? You, you go on. Then my father called, and he never calls. You know, he's one of those, yeah. I don't want to paint Koreans into a stereotype thing, but, you know, he's, I don't know. I don't think he spoke like two words to me, you know, growing up. It's very stoic, right? I knew he was born in Pyongyang, North Korea. He escaped North Korea when the UN were retreating, you know, when the Chinese came into the war. There's a lot of North Koreans did that. Uh, 
and he escaped by himself when he was 16 years old, right? So all my father's side relatives, we have no idea what happened to them, right? All I have is my mom's side in South Korea. So it's very stoic. I mean, he will just, whatever disaster hits, whatever happened, you know, just very stoic, very calm, and he just, you know, it's not very communicative, especially with his children. And most fathers, you know, many fathers are like that in that tradition. So the fact that he called is very unusual by itself. Then he goes, I want you to come back to New Jersey. Because we were, you know, they were living in New Jersey at that time. So I thought it was something bad. It had to do with my mom's health or something happened. Yeah. So I took the, the red eye. Well, there wasn't a red eye. I actually arrived around 12.50 or something, right, in Newark. Mm -hmm. You know, went to the car, went home. Takes about 30 minutes. So I was there around, you know, 12.31 or so. My dad was waiting up for me. And he has to go to work at 6.30 every morning, right? And he was waiting up for me. So something really bad happened, right? Except it... You know, it was a little weird. It does, didn't look like it was a family emergency or anything. But he said he wanted me to drive down to the city with him that night. You know, so I was on this six-hour flight from. Well, I was in LA at that time. It was in December of 2001, several months after 9/11. And you know, and he's waiting up for me at like 12:30, you know, one o'clock, and he wants me to drive to New York. You know, then at one o'clock at night. Something's going on, right? It was a little weird, a little scary because it's so, you know, so unusual. So we drove, uh, you know, we drove. I took the Henry Hudson Parkway. I mean, all the way down to the city. He wanted me to drive to NYU, New York University. That's in West Village, right? So if you know how to New York at all, to get to NYU, you just drive to the city, go to the city. But you take the Fifth Avenue down and straight down, right? And you know, usually there's an arch. That's a Watch the Square Park. It's, it's, that's where the center of the campus is. There's an arch. Usually, usually as you drive down Fifth Avenue, you see the arch. You also see the Twin Towers through those arches. And it was weird because, you know, several blocks that when you're supposed to see them, they weren't there. The only thing you saw was this eerie glow in the background. Right? And that kind of really struck me at that time because you don't, you know, you expect to see something there. And you've always seen it, you know, driving out to NYU, West Village, you know, you always drive down this, basically, Fifth Avenue, and you don't see it. So without him telling me, I just kind of pulled over. Wow, that's, and that was a little weird. Then this man who hasn't spoken to me, you know, like two words growing up, and started telling me basically his life story, you know. And I never realized that he was a he got a full scholarship to Moscow University Med School at 16. He spoke six languages. He forgot most of them, but he spoke, he still remembers some, you know, some words. He spoke Russian because he got a full scholarship to Moscow to study medicine. Chinese because he spent two years uh, in China because his dad, grandfather, was an independence fighter against Japanese during the colonial era, and they were based out of China. Well, it's kind of interesting spoke Spanish because we actually went to Paraguay. I lived in Paraguay for two and a half years before coming over to the U.S. What else? Is he spoke English. He spoke Japanese because he was educated during the Japanese colonial era, then you had to speak Japanese, then he spoke English, right? And he spoke Korean. Six so languages. Okay. So he all of a sudden became this someone. It was my dad, but, uh, you know, the first time you realize your dad is an actual person. He's a different person apart from you that has his own history as an individual. And he became a teacher to me that night. He said, grew up in North Korea, escaped by himself, 16, right? His dream of um, medicine, you know, all shattered. And, you know, Korean War is a brutal war. 34,000 Americans died, right? And, uh, you know, and two... Two to three million Korean civilians and soldiers died too, and 500,000 Chinese soldiers, I think, believed uh, perished in the war too. It's a brutal war, and living through that and having the opportunity to come to the United States, sending their kids to the best schools, right? 
and really establish himself, give, being given the opportunity. He was speaking to, uh, to me about gratitude. You know, a sense of gratitude, what, what that means. And for me, my value system was so geared towards making it, right? Because since I wasn't a doctor or a lawyer, and I wasn't on Wall Street as an investment banker, you know, so I had to be a consultant, you know, which is, you know, on the totem pole of Korean Americans, it's not that great, actually. So, you know, I was trying to make, that was my value system. And he actually turned it upside down at that night, talking about gratitude. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was weird in that sense, because it, first time you get a perspective you know, you feel like uh, you're waking up in a way, knowing your father for the first time, and thinking that it wasn't really him that drove me to make these choices. It was just my own internal preconceptions, prejudices about what my life should be about. And he was giving me things to think about to make better choices, perhaps. So he actually asked me to. My little brother, he's an architect, so he told me, as an architect, you know, you really can't do anything, you know. It's public service. I mean, what do you do as an architect? I guess there are a lot of stuff you could do, but I just didn't realize it. So he, he said, think about it, but I want you to perhaps quit your job and think about serving, you know, being a public servant in whatever capacity that you feel you want to do. And this is the story I wrote uh, in Washington Post last year. And it's got a huge reaction. And I, I was surprised by how it touched so many people. And even uh, Secretary Michael Chertoff called me, you know, and like out of the blue, one of these, you know, like, yes, who? They call him S1, right? Who? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> that was it. Thank you, sir. But, uh, you know, but it's 700 words. But it took four more years for me to actually start acting on that. And there were two factors that, uh, and that's why I really want to discuss you, with you tonight, today, is that the two issues that really held me back was the, first of all, economics, because I thought public servant, you know, they don't make that much money. So, you know, and, you know, parents, Korean parents don't have IRAs. Their IRAs are, are their children, right? So basically, you know, how, well, how do I support them? You know, how do I, you know, monthly, you know, you figure that out. So, so, so that's one of the issues. Then I realized that it's not that bad, actually. It's a, it's a pretty good job, compensation and uh, benefits, everything else. I mean, if you're just thinking on that side, on the logical side, the rationale side is actually a very good choice, you know. Especially in this economy, I think it's becoming better and better choice. But the other one that really held me back was emotion. I had a suspicion of my own emotions, although I was really touched and really surprised, and I felt like I awakened somewhat through my father's, you know, this conversation dialogue I had. I was suspicious of my, my, my own emotions. You know, I'm grateful at this point, but is that gratitude mine, or is it my parents? So what, hap what happens if all this gratitude, this emotional energy, this positive energy burns off? Because emotions at that point, I was old enough to realize it's transient by nature, right? Emotions change all the time. You know, you're in love today, you may not be tomorrow. You know, you love this, you feel good today, you, you might not feel as good. And nothing has changed except your emotional state, right? So what happens if I can't, you know, this is not for me. I find out I make this huge choice. You know, I'm a mid-career, I'm 40 years old. If I make this choice, pretty much it's, uh, you know, for the rest of my career, uh, what happens? So, you know, this, this became an ongoing discussion, basically. So this is when it starts becoming more of a journey for me. A journey to find out, you know, the title of this lecture says to make a difference through public service. But uh, the, only, the biggest difference it has made is, you know, inside me and how I thought and looked at choices that I made. And my dad actually came to the rescue once more, and he brought back this concept from Asia, from, from Korea, of aligning your three values, what you do as a person. And, you know, and these are Korean pronunciation of Chinese characters, but you know, let me pronounce it this way. First is hyo, 
which is filial piety, basically, you know, serving your parents, being loyal, faithful to your parents, taking care of them. That's the basis of a person's life, it goes. Then, higher up, you got chung, which is loyalty to your country. Then higher up than that, you got to, which is tao, right? Which is a spiritual journey to find out, the, I guess, the truth. It's a spiritual concept. Then he said, these three are not separate. They're actually in line. They're the same thing. So if you actually, in your inner spiritual journey, if you do it faithfully and truthfully enough, that's actually serving your country and also being good sons and daughters to your parents. Then he spoke to me about, that's what sense of gratitude is all about. I've been trying to teach you. The sense of gratitude is not real unless you act upon it. So if you want to really feel it deep, if you have suspicions about your sense of gratitude as emotions, you should act upon it to make it real. And he compared, you know, he made the diff to, to make this hit home for me, you know, he compared uh, North Korea to USA today. In North Korea right now, it's because I do some volunteer work with the NGOs and stuff, people are actually starving to death again. This is 10 years after 3 million people starved to death, right? In the largest, basically, humanitarian disaster in the 20th century, which is kind of largely hidden and not really spoken about. But right now, they're starting to starve to death again. And, you know, my friend just went to North Korea. He works for, you know, just one of these NGOs and, you know, go to hospitals. And it's just brutal. They have to reuse syringes. And it's just really primitive. And then he points at me. He goes, you're sitting in a nice car, in a nice apartment. You travel all over the world. And if I hadn't made across the border, if the UN hadn't retreated, or if one of the thousand things hasn't happened the way exactly it happened, I would actually be one of those kids, or, well, not kid anymore, but North Korean trying to make ends meet, or starving to death, or in a gulag somewhere, or, you know, dead, or miserable. So basically, you know, he goes, he actually used an American proverb. But for the grace of God, there go I. Which is so true. If it wasn't, whatever you want to call it, karma or accident of fate, because my parents are actually Buddhists. But, you know, he used this really, basically, American Christian proverb to say, so grace is a matter of having the sense of gratitude for the things that you've been given. And awareness that this gratitude isn't real unless you act upon it, then there's one more thing that you should know. Awareness that you don't exist by yourself. So he kind of called us three, three concepts into this concept called grace. First of all is that you don't exist by yourself. You know, and all of a sudden became, you know, I felt like for that brief moment I was in an episode of Kung Fu or something. <laughs> and he goes, you don't exist by yourself. You exist only because others exist. Other people are there, you know. Then he did this little funny exercise for me. So describe yourself to me without using your name or your organization or who your parents are or who your friends are. And I couldn't do it. It's just a simple exercise really opened my eyes. I couldn't do it. So that was the first kind of a shock. Then it says gratitude as an emotion just remains with you, then it disappears. But gratitude as an action is going to be there forever. It's going to be rooted in your values, in your spiritual values. That's how you know. So if you're waiting for gratitude to be a concrete foundation bedrock of spiritual value before you commit to public service, you'll be waiting for a long time. So he just told me what, you know, basically what Nike adds is just do it. Then you realize that it's there already. So basically that's, you know, it took me three years to realize that, to go through that dialogue. So I quit my job. I went back to NYU, majored in basically nonprofit management. Then I went to candidate school for mid-career program. They have a one-year program. And, and I chose something, you know, in a career, in a federal career that, uh, that really affects people directly. 
And I thought TSA was a perfect choice because everything that we do at TSA actually affects people. And we get, we hear about it. <laughs> right, and you do have to take your shoes off still. <laughs> and no liquids. And we do hear about it. But uh, you can see that it does make a difference because we know what kind of difference it's making. So for me, federal career was a, more of a, in a way, a personal journey in how it made a difference in how I saw and how, what kind of choices I made. And at the same time, confirmation of that such a public service career can, does make a difference uh, to the people. And it all rises, I made that decision and out of my own sense of grace, I guess. So although I'm not a Christian, because you know, I was raised in a Buddhist household, I can't say I'm not Buddhist either, but uh, basically. But it was my own, in a way, spiritual journey that kind of manifested in my choice to become a public servant. And I thought BYU would be the perfect space to really talk about this because I don't know if you guys realize, but BYU is actually one of the most revered, respected uh, organizations in Korea. Because if you go to Korea, the most posh part of Seoul, there's a McDonald's. If you go to McDonald's, there's always two BYU students doing their missionary work right there, speaking perfect Korean. Right there, they're a fixture. And that's when I first encountered BYU, actually, when I worked there about 15 years ago. So serving to reinforce your sense of gratitude and grace and making decisions out of that sense of grace, I think that's uh, what, whatever decisions you make, I think that's the only way you can make the right decision. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm good. We've got a few minutes left. Uh, Jason's agreed to take a few questions. Let me ask the first, and then Drew has a, a mic, and we'll ask you to ask your questions in the mic so we can record them. I'm curious, your, your story is so compelling. I'm curious, um, now that you've been in federal service for a while, how common is it? How many of the folks there uh, ended up there because of their own spiritual journey, or, or what's your sense of that? You know, they say Americans are not spiritual people. That's not true. Because I went, actually went through the TSO training, the screeners training, because it's really difficult to become a screener. I mean, it's really difficult. I went through a two-week training, and the things that they have to do, and they have to keep in mind, they have to adjust, it's really difficult. I, mean, I had trouble passing the, you know, the test. And the people that were there, it's actually, you know, was the whole gamut. You know, people who were inspired by 9-11, who wanted to come, and come back into service to serve in whatever capacity they could. And, you know, there were honest and they had a sense of commitment and the thing that united us was a sense of mission and it wasn't a mission you know in a concrete sense but it was a spiritual mission so for them i think everyone you know especially in the beginning who joined tsa i think they were in that sense spiritually driven to join uh, my name is daniel woods and my question is for those who are contemplating maybe going and working in the federal service, where are the most job opportunities right now that you know of? Job opportunities. In my job hunting, actually, TSA and uh, other DHS components actually stood out because of the flexibility. Uh, I could have gone to State Department, I guess. You know, it's other legacy agencies, they call it. But legacy agencies, oh. To me, it was not for me because uh, they were too structured. You know, you had to do two years of this, three years of this, three years of that, three years of that, ten years of this. You know, then you have these structures, and if you do all that, then you become this. So, for some sense, for some people, you know, they might like it, but for places like TSA, uh, it's very innovative, and we are trying out different stuff. It's very fluid still, so there are a lot of things that you could do that you wouldn't be otherwise be able to do. So, I would look at. You know, I don't want to just plug my, you know, my own agency, but uh, TSA is very innovative and flexible. And other components, too, other DHS components, I think because we're still maturing, 
I think there's a lot of uh, flexibility there and openings that you could uh, maybe take a look at. And if you go to uh, makingthedifference.org, actually they have uh, very nice uh, guidelines on how to do that. And also applying for a federal job, uh, we went in as a special recruiting program, but at the same time once you're in there, you realize how it's not that easy. You know, it seems easy, but it's not. So you really have to uh, cater your resume. And, uh, you know, you, they call it KSAs, the questions you have to answer. Those have to be in certain formats and certain keywords has to be in there. Otherwise, you won't get to the next round. So those things are like technical skills issue that if you're interested, I'll, you know, if you just email me later on, I'll just give you more resources that you can look through. Uh, my name is Kevin Tomaresi. Um, kind of along the same guidelines, um, if we're considering a career in the federal government, the federal service, um, what sort of skills or um, skill sets would you recommend that we start to develop here in college as we're getting ready to apply? There's no general skill set, I think I can say, you know, per se. But the thing is, uh, go to USA Jobs, obviously, and just look at uh, the questions they ask and what kind of words they use to ask those questions. I think those are really important. And uh, maybe look at sample KSAs, you know, the sample answers, successful answers, because they'll give you uh, really good guidelines. Also, it's surprising, but, you know, federal government is a field. You know, like uh, Department of Defense is actually a whole industry or field by itself. And DHS shares some DOD field or culture, but, you know, DHS is, is making its own set of culture and requirement certifications. So just look at what kind of certifications you might need. For example, I never realized program manager certification was so important within the federal government. You know, it's huge to have a perhaps something like PMP, program manager professional certification, things like that. Those actually really help, uh, you know, it's really elevate your, I guess, credibility as you apply to these positions. You mentioned before the aspects of, you know, the financial aspect and, you know, some of us have prejudices against being a Fed or, or working for the government. What would you say to those of us who are worried about being able to really make a difference, about being able to really impact ch or affect change and, and impact the world in some way through, through working through the federal government? I think that's a, that's a conflict between what we do and how we want what we do to be reflected as a change, as a making a difference in the world, because you won't see that. Because the thing that's different, that it took me, it wasn't easy adjusting, you know, truthfully. You know, I thought, you know, I adapt well to new situations, I said, you know, it'll be a breeze. It took me, you know, six, I'm still adjusting, because, uh, because it's the government, because it's the taxpayer's money, there are a lot of safeguards you have to go through. They're necessary, but that does delay things, so once you have a brilliant idea, you can't just go do that. So, but eventually, so you have to kind of shape your expectations so that you see your hand in certain things. And once you become a program manager of sorts, then you can see your hands in things more specifically, I guess. But uh, you have to realize that everything the government does is basically a collaborative effort then you won't really see your name stamped or have a direct line from you, what you have done, to that person, you know, that citizen, unless you work in those kind of areas. But, you know, you, know, you have to work within the bureaucratic realm. So for me, that was, diff you know, that was difficult too. But uh, it was, I think for me, it was still, I'm still adjusting. It's a matter of adapting your expectations and kind of shaping it, not lowering it, but shaping it. But, you know, it's, I think it's always going to be there. I think it's the main reason that kind of, you know, the kind of difference between your expectation, you want to make a difference, you want to see the difference between what you actually have to do every single day that actually, you know, sidetracks many people. Anything else? Uh, let me say again, thanks to our speaker. He's got just a couple of minutes before he needs to run to his lunch appointment, so those of you who would like to...
speak to him personally. If you've got a few minutes to do that, join me again in thanking Mr.